Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this installment of the K Perpetua Speaker Series. Today, we're going to be hearing from Josh, Josh McInnes, and he will be sharing with us ecological aspects of transient killer whales off the California and Oregon coast. And our next uh, presentation will be Saturday, January 22nd, and we're going to be uh, learning about Oregon's red abalone from Kendall Smith. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that the Cape Perpetua area landscape from Yahats to Florence is the tra traditional territory of the Selects tribe and Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayusla tribe, and acknowledge the tribal governments and their roles historically and today in taking care of these lands. And you can learn more about um, these two tribes on their respective websites. A little bit about Cape Perpetual Collaborative. Um, my name is Tara Dubois. I'm the communications coordinator for the Collaborative, and it's an honor to um, organize and host the series. Uh, the Collaborative's vision is to foster conservation within local communities for scientific exchange, management, awareness, and stewardship from the land to the sea in and around the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. And our three guiding principles are community engagement, leveraging resources, engaging in partnerships. And we have a variety of partners. You can see the logos at the bottom here. Uh, these are our founding partners, uh, but we also have a variety of local partners, uh, small businesses, um, city governments, and uh, also, also some other uh, small nonprofits uh, that without all of our partners, we could not accomplish this work. Uh, real quick about the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. It's one of five in Oregon. It's Oregon's largest marine reserve. Um, and in addition to protected areas to the north and south, there's some form of protected waters that stretch between Yahats and Florence. Uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife is the management agency of Oregon's marine reserves. And you can see the images here over on the right. Uh, these are some images taken from their research under the water. Um, and you can check out more images and learn about uh, Oregon's Marine Reserves at OregonMarineReserves.com. Uh, community Science at Cape Perpetua, the collaborative hosts a variety of community science projects. Many of them are seasonal, um, but we also host monthly beach cleanups year round. And our Cape Perpetua BioBlitz series can occur at any time of the year, uh, which helps us document biodiversity. Uh, so join up on the iNaturalist.org app uh, if you haven't already. And if you uh, join up with our Cape Perpetua BioBlitz series project, and any images or observations you make within our footprint will automatically get uploaded to our project. Uh, we also host a Young Scientist webinar series the second Tuesday of the month, October through April. And you can find out more information about all of our events and our presentations at our website, capeperpetualcollaborative.org. I always like to encourage folks to join us on our Facebook and our YouTube page. And if you like the work that we're doing and you feel inclined, um, you can donate. There is a donate button on our website as well at the top and just click on that and it'll take you through the steps. And with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Josh McInnes is a marine ecologist and marine mammal researcher from Victoria, BC, Canada. He is a master's student and researcher at the University of British Columbia's Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries Marine Mammal Research Unit. Josh's, Josh's research focuses on the ecology and behavior of marine mammals in British Columbia and Monterey Bay, California, with studies focusing on the foraging behavior, diet, and ecology of transient killer whales and rhizo dolphins. And with that, Josh, I'm going to stop share, and you can bring yours up. And as Josh is bringing up his presentation, I just want to let you know, um, the audience, to know that if you've got questions throughout the presentation, you can feel free to add them to the chat or the Q&A, and we will uh, get to those at the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Josh, it's all yours. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. I'm excited to, to chat with everyone uh, about a, a very important topic and um, an exciting topic uh, regarding killer whales. Um, it's uh, for me um, a little bit more uh, about how uh, the killer whales of the Oregon coast and California, which are two areas which are predominantly not a lot of information is available 
Um, this little this photograph here on the side here really shows a, a, a family group of transients um, that were found about 200 kilometers off the Oregon coast, off Newport. And I'm excited to, to share some more information about uh, what, we're, what we're finding. Um, this study, I'm currently um, I'm conducting a master's thesis work at uh, the University of British Columbia. And this work is looking at um, really the, the community structure of transient killer whales in the Northeastern Pacific or along the West Coast of uh, the North America. And it's really a, a group of different individuals and, and uh, collaboration between NOAA fisheries, uh, Moss Landing Marine Laboratories in, in Monterey, California, um, as well as uh, the o Oregon State University um, Marine Life Studies and uh, our work with the Transient Killer Whale Research Project. So a little bit about me. Um, I am a, a killer whale obsessed individual. Uh, there's a lot of us that are just it fell in love with orcas um, and following these charismatic apex predators. Uh, this is a, I spend a lot of time in Monterey, California. It's kind of a second home. I am currently in Vancouver, British Columbia, but I um, spend a lot of time seasonally heading down to, to Monterey where I will be caught sometimes at the aquarium or <clears throat> offshore uh, photographing killer whales. Uh, just to jump in though, um, so we have three kinds of killer whale in the Northeastern Pacific that are recognized and we call these ecotypes. And an ecotype is basically a genetically distinct um, population of individuals. On um, these three ecotypes, we have the residents, um, the transients and the offshores. Um, every, a lot of people know of the resident killer whales, which are, are uh, the famous salmon eaters. Uh, there's a couple of different communities like the Southern residents off of Southern Vancouver Island, Washington state, uh, which right now are currently in date, critically endangered. Uh, we have a northern resident population that hangs off uh, basically midway up Vancouver Island um, to southeast Alaska. Um, and we also have an Alaskan community, which is predominantly southeast Alaska all the way up to the Aleutian Islands. Um, resident killer whales, um, it, all three of these kinds of killer whales actually can be distinguished based on uh, morphology or some of the characteristics. Um, and with residents, you can kind of see it's more of a rounded dorsal fin. Uh, and this area right here, how we recognize them is a, what we call a saddle patch. Uh, these saddle patches can either be closed, which you can see here in the transient form, uh, this big solid gray area, or it can be an open saddle, which um, can have these black pigments that kind of enter in kind of a design. Um, the second uh, form of killer what we have are transients, which are the focus of this presentation. And transients are uh, mammal hunting specialists. Uh, they hunt predominantly harbor seals, uh, sea lions, porpoise, and large whales. Um, and morphologically, they are also different. They have these more pointed dorsal fins, um, large solid gray saddle patches, and, and no transients ever been identified with, a, with an open saddle. Um, we also have um, the, uh, a rare form of killer whale that we don't really see too often. Um, we have a few records off of Oregon, though, uh, are these offshore killer whales, which are, are ecologically as well as um, acoustically and genetically a little bit more similar to the resident form. Uh, they're a bit smaller in body size, uh, but they also have this rounded dorsal fin, and often it's quite notched. Uh, the saddle patch can either be the solid saddle or it can actually be open in some individuals. Um, but between these three types, they live sympatrically in uh, the Pacific coast, but they don't associate or interbreed. Um, the residents uh, live in pods of 25 to 50 whales. The transients, we often see five to 10 whales um, for these matrilineal groups, such as a, a mother and her offspring. And then the offshores can be up to 100 individuals. They um, often are in large groups. Uh, transient killer whales now are found throughout the, the Northeastern Pacific. We even have them up into the Bering Sea. Uh, there's a few different um, communities or genetically distinct populations. Um, and you can see here in the yellow, uh, the stark yellow region here uh, that overlaps into Southeast Alaska, up into the Gulf of Alaska and into the Bering Sea and the Aleutians. Uh, the Gulf of Alaska transients are what is more recognized as the GAB population, which is the Gulf of Alaska, Aleutian Islands, Bering Sea stock. Um, is oh, what happened there? Uh, is a, a population of approximately they uh, believe to be less than 500 individuals. Uh, but currently, there's a lot of new genetic work looking into them, um, and there possibly is more than uh, one population within this region. Um, then we also have what is called the AT ones. Uh, this little uh, blue dot right here, uh, which is a Prince William Sound in the Kenai Fjords. Um, and this community is currently critically endangered uh, to the point where there's only seven individuals left um, 
and the AT1s were first discovered in 1984, and they number 22 whales, uh, but after the Exxon Valdez oil spill, that population dro dropped dramatically, um, and we have uh, far less now, and the population with no reproductive female and no new calves will likely go extinct within the near future. Uh, the population that's the most studied and well known uh, is what we call the West Coast transients, which uh, you can see here, they have a range between Southeast Alaska all the way down to Southern California. Uh, even though they're the, the best studied, there is currently not a lot known about their overall uh, community structure. And we're starting to find, and part of the research I'm conducting at UBC, is that there is likely um, at least two or more communities that are within this, uh, this, this genetically distinct population. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So my interest in killer whales really kind of spiked, especially with off the Oregon coast. Um, I started uh, whale watching when I was around 12 years old, and I, I grew up on northern Vancouver Island, but I spent a lot of my um, later teen years and into my early adulthood um, working in Victoria, British Columbia, which is a, an amazing place, the capital of BC, uh, and a, a real hotspot for viewing killer whales. Um, it's the heart of the Salish Sea. And I was at the, at the time I was on a research expedition um, and we were photographing a group of transients and we can photo identify killer whales based on the different notches. Uh, you can see in the dorsal fins that are these congenital features that stay with the whales for their entire lives or scratches on their that white, that gray saddle patch. Um, and this is an event that really interested me because we, had, we, we have a pretty good knowledge of uh, the different whales, individuals that are these photo identified individuals. Uh, but off of this one, it was one event, we had a few transients that had been killing a, a sea lion. And I had been uh, given a call from a fisherman that uh, said that there was a, a larger group of killer whales were headed our way. Initially, our thoughts were that they were potentially the southern residents that were coming inbound into Juan de Fuca Strait. Uh, and that's very exciting because we don't see close interactions that often between transients and residents. Uh, but uh, to our surprise, it was actually a larger group of transients that showed up, many that we recognized. Uh, we actually identified 50 different whales, which was quite a shock. And at least two of these whales uh, we didn't recognize, uh, in particular this large male right here, who's got the, the nickname uh, can opener based on his dorsal fin here. Um, and that kind of spurred my interest in trying to understand a little bit more about transients outside of the Salish Sea. Uh, and that uh, this animal it took about two months to identify was actually from a, a population that frequents mostly outer coast waters of California. So I spent some time looking to try to figure out who he was. Uh, and then um, that kind of my interest in open ocean killer whales kind of just uh, in understanding where killer whales inhabit the more dynamic seas like Oregon coast and California really spurred from. Here's a photograph taken from uh, colleagues at NOAA Southwest Fisheries Science Center um, of a, a group of transients also in the open ocean. And we really don't know enough about their role in these open ocean environments. Um, compared to coastal waters where there's a, a, a large supply of pinnipeds, seals and sea lions and small cetaceans, the open ocean is a lot less uh, uh, diverse in its nutrient ability as a very, what we call legal trophic nutrient poor in certain areas it can be big vast deserts. So where do, what do killer whales do in these areas, especially as apex predators, where are they getting their food? Um, is it, you know, are transients or are they transients or are these a different population that frequent these open oceans off Oregon or California? And that's kind of where this research is kind of heading. Uh, so one of the first studies uh, came out from colleagues at uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada. It was a, a report uh, that really kind of uh, looked at the habitat characteristics of killer whales, uh, transient killer whales in British Columbia. And as you can see here, uh, this map shows um, different encounters uh, and kind of this, uh, the first um, description of what could be an outer coast and coastal or inner coast uh, a, a community or an assemblage within the West Coast transient population that I explained earlier that kind of runs down from Southeast Alaska to Southern California. Um, and you can see, and one, one of the findings was that the, the outer coast population seems to prefer waters uh, that are a little bit further offshore, deeper um, compared to the coastal community. So that kind of spurred more of my interest and got me um, trying to figure out a little bit more about them. In addition, uh, these outer coast and coastal transients seem to have a bit of different vocalizations. Uh, killer whales rely on vocalizing for social reasons, for finding food. They, they
You have three different types of mobilizations. Uh, using application, which is used to find your way around or locate prey. Um, they also used, use uh, pulse calls, which are more of a communication or whistles for a short, short range communication. Uh, and the, the, between the different transient communities, we do see differences in uh, the sounds that they produce. This is a, a vocalization of a coastal transient. Uh, this is taken from Oceans Network Canada. to stop. Uh, and here is a, a recording of what we believe to be an outer coast transients. It's a little bit more fainter uh, based on the acoustics, but you can kind of hear the difference. And that was taken off of uh, the Claypot Canyon, which is a deep water canyon off of uh, the west coast of Vancouver Island. The last vocalization we recorded was during a gray whale calf predation event uh, in Monterey by a group of outer coast transients as well. You can see that the vocalizations here in, these, in the sonogram here showing a pulse call. You can kind of see that spike. Um, transient killer whales predominantly are silent when hunting. Uh, usually when they're trying to search for prey, they, they use what's called passive listening. So they hear a seal splashing in the shallows or the clicks of a dolphin. And they'll kind of sneak up on their prey using stealth. But once a hunt is um, fully involved and the individual has actually have found prey, uh, you'll hear these vocalizations quite frequently. Uh, so my adventures down the coast, um, I kind of fell in love with Oregon and California. Uh, and this after that uh, event with the transients in the Salish Sea that were from this region. And my partner and I and a couple of researchers decided to head down the coast um, to California in 2015. Uh, and we kind of stopped along the way to, to learn a little bit more about uh, what the killer whale uh, scene was like off of Oregon uh, in different areas. And what from our surprise was that there wasn't a lot of information for Oregon or California. Uh, there was some research looking at the southern residents, which um, often make their way down in the wintertime or in spring to uh, Oregon and California coast. And there were some reports and sightings. Uh, you can see here the whale watching center in Depot Bay, Oregon. Uh, we talked to a lot of the naturalists and uh, what we found was there was a major data gap. Uh, so we arrived in Monterey Bay and uh, from 2015 to about 2019, I acted as the research coordinator for a great nonprofit called Marine Life Studies. Um, and our goal was to really try to catalog and figure out how many killer whales may belong to this outer coast transient community. Um, and we had a lot of fun. There's a great group of researchers. We'd go on daily um, uh, field surveys, uh, collecting observational data. Um, and uh, we would spend most of our time looking at the different groups of killer whales. And this lasted, like I said, for about close to five, five years. So just to, uh, I wanna share some information about really what we're seeing off the Oregon coast. Um, the Oregon coast is just a highly dynamic area. It's um, an open ocean habitat that um, it's difficult to track killer whales. Um, it's very remote in some areas. And for us, it was, it's been a bit of a challenge um, in particular getting uh, photographs of orcas, uh, but what we've been finding is that there is some trends for this area. 
Uh, but first, uh, one of the first studies for killer whales off Oregon uh, was published in, in 1992 of Green et al. Um, and they were conducting aerial surveys up and down the outer coast of Washington and Oregon. Uh, uh, the major uh, reason for this study was to look at the gray whale population, but they, they did look at other species as well. And what they found was uh, in Oregon, the number of whales identified were actually about 24. There was about eight eight animals, eight group, different groups. Um, but one of the findings I found most interesting was that, uh, and I've chatted with the, the lead author of the study, is that a lot of the killer whales were not recognized. They were either new groups that had never been seen before uh, in the Sailor Sea region. Uh, and, and this is something a finding we're currently um, also seeing. Uh, so right now, um, our study uh, from 2008 to 2021, we've identified close to 97 different encounters with killer whales or sightings, um, encompassing a couple of different areas. Uh, you can see here uh, in the, on this map, um, we have a couple of different uh, variables here. You can see there's the unknown groups of killer whales, so people that send in photographs of, of uh, killer whales that we can't identify, either that the photo quality isn't that great or the, you know they're too far away, um, but the, at least it shows a presence. Uh, we also have uh, in the red diamond here, you can see coastal transients. This is a uh, transients that we typically find in the coastal waters of BC um, that hunt seals. Uh, and then also we're starting to notice uh, these outer coasts, uh, the yellow triangle, um, which are more, for, more further offshore. Um, and then also something new that are, um, I'll share a little bit more information, uh, an oceanic group, a couple of different oceanic groups that are not known that spend most of their time seaward of the continental shelf. Um, observed group size for killer whales off the Oregon coast. Uh, an average is around four to five, very similar to what we see with transients elsewhere. Um, uh, with rarity, we see um, individuals, larger groups of 25, which are, which are very rare. Um, and you can see here, this map is kind of more um, showing regions of the Oregon coast. You can see, um, uh, especially off of Depot Bay, uh, areas off of Newport. Um, these areas here are also high traffic zones for people, um, very tourist related, a lot of observer effort here. So um, one of the difficulties is accounting for observer effort and where a lot of people are spending their time. And maybe the fact that we're just not seeing more sightings in these other areas uh, like on the, the left map here, maybe just because there's not a lot of people looking. But one thing is that they are spending their time in this area and people are seeing them. Um, another thing uh, is that there, this area is also um, has a dense population of harbor seals, which is the main prey of transients uh, in the coastal community. Uh, here's a photograph taken from a colleague, uh, Lee Torres at Oregon State University um, of a male we know as T49C. He's a coastal transient. And right away you can identify and you can see the two notches midway up his dorsal fin which this will stay for his life but these transients often enter into these little areas like florence oregon up in the up into the um even up into river systems off the oregon coast we see them going into bays and harbors looking for seals uh the coastal transients are very much specialists at at um, searching for for harbor seals in in quite shallow areas um, like I said, their main prey, Pacific harbor seal, uh, which is also the most abundant marine mammal in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, their population has increased substantially since early, the early 70s, where uh, seal calls were put in place from both federal governments. Um, they, but up and down the coast, what's really interesting is harbor seals have this uh, uh, seasonal climb. So as you head uh, south down the coast, um, you start to see the seasonality change. And off of the Oregon coast, we see um, harbor seals being born in April, May, even into June. Or off of southern Vancouver Island, we see harbor seals being born in uh, July, August, and September. And um, studies by Robin Baird and Larry Dill in the 1990s were the first to show that transient killer whales show a seasonal trend uh, in response or correlated to harbor seal pupping season. Uh, and they come into the area uh, more often to hunt harbor seal pups that are being born around that time, or what we call a post-pupping season. So what we found, uh, this is preliminary work we're looking at, is that off the Oregon coast, we do see a similar seasonal spike. Um, and once again, this could be involving that in May and June, we're getting kind of into the summer area. People are visiting the coast more, going on whale watching tours. 
but also that we're seeing a lot of people from their homes uh, just along shore that are seeing killer whales uh, more often in May and June off the Oregon coast. So if uh, this spring coming up, it might be a good time to, you know, take your binoculars out and uh, try to see if you can find orcas yourself. Um, so what we also did is in collaboration with uh, Brian Wright, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, he, uh, we were able to kind of do a, a, a look at um, both the killer whale presence and harbor seals. Uh, you can see on the left map here is that killer whale presence. And then on the right map here, you can see the harbor seal haul out site. So a haul out site is where a harbor seal goes to rest, molt, give birth. Um, and you can see how many different harbor seal haul outs there are. Um, and you can kind of see this little bit of this crossover here. And uh, you can see here that killer whale sightings is an overlay map showing uh, all the killer whale sightings and then the heat signature basically of where the most dense areas of harbor seals are. Uh, you can kind of see um, that the transients are very much in this coastal area in response to harbor seals. Um, and as I mentioned, they go quite into shallow water looking for these seal pups. Um, they'll go right into outer, these outer coast reefs or these uh, exposed outer coast reefs uh, that dot the Oregon coast. They'll be searching in kelp beds. Often harbor seals will take refuge amongst the bull kelp or inside crevices where transients will kind of patrol. They'll, they'll even go real close to the, to the rocks and as this video here shows. There they are, there they are. Uh, so that was a great soundtrack. Um, there's some killer whales here hunting. You can kind of see a sea lion that's high out of the water there. But you can see how close they really go to the side of these, these exposed reefs in search of prey. They are, they are. Uh, so our next study, um, one of the things we just finished, which we're, we're quite excited about, is we this photo identification study that started in Monterey, California and, uh, and off the Oregon coast. Um, we, we wanted to know a little bit more about the transients in this region. Um, photo identification studies of transient killer whales off of southern Vancouver Island or Vancouver Island, southeast Alaska and Washington have been going on since the 70s, but there has been a lot of information uh, on photo identification of killer whales south of uh, Washington state and off the outer coast. So we, we conducted, uh, we had 13 years of data, uh, which was contributed from uh, multiple sources, um, either for, uh, from our surveys in Monterey Bay. Um, uh, also we collaborated with NOAA's National Marine Fishery Service, uh, who are doing offshore surveys for research ships and also whale watch operators along the Oregon and California coast. Our study encompassed uh, quite a large area. Um, from Point Conception, California, all the way up to Astoria, and up to 560 kilometers off the outer coast seaward of the continental shelf. Um, this also encompassed multiple sightings of killer whales. Um, uh, you can see here some of these um, were a bunch of different ones. We have the uh, we have coastal, outer coast, as well as oceanic killer whales were seen throughout this area. After collecting all this data, though, we spent we would spend eight hours a day on a boat photographing and collecting data, and then we would spend uh, almost equal amount of time in a laboratory. Uh, we're very thankful to Moss Landing Marine Laboratories who uh, enable us to access their facilities, including uh, their labs, their library resources, and we spent a lot of time looking through photographs of different whales. We actually analyzed over 113,000 photographs of killer whales up and down the coast. Um, to try to get a handle on this. And, and some of our results were, um, so transients killer whales were photographed between 2006 and 2018. Uh, we identified, uh, we had 146 different encounters with, with killer whales. Um, and this included 150 unique individuals um, and 30 different natural lineal groups. Uh, as you can see here, this is a female, well-known female OCT3030. So we, we adapted a new identification system um, based on the fact that a lot of the first killer whale catalog to be produced uh, for killer whales in California was in 1997, uh, but never was updated. So by this time, a lot of individuals had either been grown or had died, uh, and there hadn't been any public um, available catalogs or even IDs for many of the individuals. So um, our system basically meant outer coast transient. Uh, for to distinguish from anything in the coastal transient community, we just gave an OCT number. And as you can see here, this would be the 30th animal. That's OCT 30 here. And then if she had an offspring, it'd be OCT 30B, uh, would be her second offspring. And if she had, a, if her offspring, OCT 30B, had a calf, then we'd give it the one number. And if she had a second calf, it'd be two, and so on. 
Uh, so this was kind of a, the system we, we used that was based on a Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada system uh, that was adapted by Graham Ellis in the 1990s. Uh, so, and we were able to catalog many individuals. Uh, so every year differed. You can see here just on the x-axis number of individuals that were photo identified, uh, number of individuals and the number of years photo identified. Um, and you can see that um, within at least, you know, 60 animals were identified at least within one year of the study. Um, each year though, we did find that we found new individuals. We were able to see catalog new animals throughout the study period. Uh, and that continues to be the case as well. Um, this year, we've actually identified a group of um, nine new uh, presumed transient killer whales uh, in Mulder Race. So this number is continuing to increase. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, transient killer whales have this matrilineal system. So it's often a female and her offspring. And the study really enabled us to track the different relationships and members of a group. So like a mother and her associated offspring. Uh, so say for this, Emma, this individual named Emma, OCT30, uh, her daughter and her grandchildren are involved here and her presumed brother uh, traveled together in this one family pod. Um, as this, uh, her daughter now is spending a lot of time by herself um, because she's actually had a third offspring recently. Um, and they have now uh, separated. So this is kind of that movement where um, as they grow, they start to spend more time away from their parents as they start to have more offspring. A transient killer whale society is very fluid that way. Um, and transients, um, they live in these smaller groups so that enable them to hunt uh, marine mammal prey more stealthily compared to the larger groups, as I mentioned earlier, for residents and offshores. Uh, we were able to also look at individuals throughout their life. Uh, this adult male here is an animal we, we photographed in 2006, and we got to see as he got older, um, all the way up into 2019. Uh, and we have even sightings of him now, and he's a full-grown adult male. Uh, this study really shed light, though, because we, we made a comparison uh, of different communities to the killer whales we had photo identified from. Uh, we discovered for open ocean areas, we have these offshore killer whales, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we have the subset of the West Coast transient population we're calling the outer coast transients. Uh, but what was really interesting is that we found a potential oceanic uh, population that spends its time in, in open waters. Um, and so this is kind of where we're getting more interested is that some of these oceanic whales, in particular this way, this group of four killer whales we had identified close to 300 kilometers off of Monterey um, during a NOAA Southwest Fisheries Science Center cruise, uh, were involved in a, a predation of a cetacean. Uh, and we really don't know much about these groups of killer whales, even though we've, um, we've been able to identify 40 different oceanic killer whales between 1997 and 2021. We currently don't know if they're transient, if they're their own population, um, but until we have more information, either we see them in association with other known transients or until we have genetic information in these whales, we, we have given what's called an OCX number, uh, which means outer coast unknown killer whale. Um, but a lot of these whales also have um, these circular scars uh, which is um, result from the cookie cutter shark, which is a warm deep water species of squalene shark that lives in the open ocean. And these sharks leave devastating crater sized wounds on large vertebrates. Uh, and they, they're only found in these open ocean pelagic ecosystems. Uh, and we don't see these wounds on any of the, the killer whales that live in neuritic or coastal waters. Um, and that just shows us that these killer whales spend more time distributed in, in deeper offshore waters. Uh, the results from the study were published uh, this year in June. We're very proud to say we have a new catalog that was published as a NOAA technical memorandum. Uh, and I'll share a link with that at the end of the talk that you can access for free. It's, uh, it's got a catalog of all the killer whales that we were able to uh, identify in the study um, and for the Oregon and California coast. Uh, and you're welcome to use that and share it as you like. Uh, so behavior of ecologies, uh, behavior of ecology of transient killer whales off of uh, California was a, a really interesting part of the study is understanding kind of the dynamics of killer whales down here. These whales are a lot different from the coastal killer whales that predominantly feed on seals, harbor seals. These whales uh, seem to specialize more on uh, sea lions and gray whale calves. Um, our study was predominantly in this area called the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which is a spectacular place if you get a chance to visit. Um, it's 
uh, an area that's especially the Monterey Bay uh, has is bisected by this large under deep undersea canyon uh, that goes almost close to 160 kilometers offshore, um, but provides a deep sea ecosystem that is fairly close and accessible for researchers. So. Uh, these transients that we're finding, these outer coast transients that spend most of their time uh, near the continental shelf edge or break um, are difficult to access from areas where the continental shelf is far from shore. So say the Oregon coast, British Columbia, it's difficult to get on offshore surveys. Uh, but uh, in this area of Monterey Bay, that continental shelf comes very close to shore uh, within five kilometers of Moss Landing. Uh, and this is where we can really access um, and photograph these individuals. But we do from rare encounters with birders um, uh, that are birding expeditions or from NOAA researchers or tuna fishermen who we've been collaborating with, we notice a trend that a lot of these outer coast killer have been seen in other canyon areas um, along the coast. So California was very similar, kind of, you know, you could see the majority of these sightings, high observer effort in Monterey Bay, uh, but also spread out along the coast for these outer coast transients. We had some rare instances where coastal transients predominantly seen in Washington and British Columbia had been identified off the California coast, even though it's a rare, um, a rare, but then that sighting started to peter out as you head south off the Southern California area. And our, our furthest south sighting was near San Diego. Uh, Monterey, though, as I mentioned, um, is where most sightings are. And you can notice here this canyon now, uh, the deep canyon. You can see a lot of the sightings involved in the canyon area. And there, there's a little bit of a hypothesis we have for the reason for that. Um, you can see here uh, these two male transients um, are patrolling this canyon area. They're looking for, uh, this was in the spring, they're typically looking for gray whale calves. Uh, in the springtime, uh, we noticed we had a bit of a bimodal distribution, so two different peaks. Uh, a lot of sightings happening in April and May, and this is during the time when gray whale calves and their mothers are actually moving their way up the coast uh, from the warm uh, subtropical lagoons of Baja, California, Mexico. And uh, they're the last ones to really head up the coast. The gray whale calves really need that energy to move their way north as they head up to Vancouver Island, British Columbia, Alaska, into the, the Bering Sea, uh, where their feeding grounds are. Um, but they have to, when they come through, they cross the Monterey Bay submarine canyon. Um, they cut right across the bay. Instead of following the coast where they're kind of protected, they go right across the bay. Um, you can also see here, uh, there's a second peak. We're still not too sure where the second peak has really resulted from. Um, we speculate it might be related to their main prey, which are California sea lions, um, but, um, or it could be that they're following the gray whale southward. But as of yet, we don't have any predation events involving gray whales outside of this, this spring period. Um, as they're hunting, no transients are very cryptic. The deep blue waters of uh, Monterey Bay allow them to conceal themselves as they're hunting. Here's a nice small video showing um, a group of transients that were on the hunt just before they attacked a gray whale calf. You can kind of see here that that as they get further away here that they kind of become silhouetted with the the, the dark blue water uh this form of um this form of camouflage or uh, counter shading um enables them potentially to be able to sneak up on prey um so diet wise for the killer whales we're seeing in california really ranges um often we come across sightings where or encounters where we don't know the prey it's often tissue that's at the surface or blubber um where seagulls and uh albatross net are feeding but we were either too late to see the actual prey um and that it's an unknown animal uh we see a lot of california sea lion being predominantly killed in monterey bay we also have um, like I said, the gray whale calves, and a lesser extent, harbor seals, common dolphin, you know, northern elephant seals, Mickey whales, dolls, porpoise, and Pacific white-sided dolphins. So uh, we do see a bit of a preference for the two main sea lion and gray whales. Um, as I mentioned, gray whales making that migration up the coast. Gray whale females will often hide in the kelp beds as they move north. Um, they're very much adapted to be in coastal waters. So they'll, they'll stay in the kelp beds close to shore where it's difficult for transients to hunt, uh, especially outer coast where it can be more dangerous to hunt a, a large adult female gray whale. Um, and they'll kind of hug this coast. 
But as they cut across that canyon, um, the transients often hone in. They'll listen for the breathing of the gray whales. Uh, and once the hunt is on, the transients will often um, try to outpace the female gray whale and her calf. Um, and they'll either try to separate the calf by getting in between them. The calf often doesn't have really the energy. It hasn't built up the store of energy. It's still pretty new. Um, and as it goes across this deep water canyon, the transients have that advantage of being in deep water, being able to try to wear out the calf. And that first thing is trying to separate the mum and calf. Um, then the killer was once the calf is separated, what we often see is the killer was ramming uh, the gray whale calf's rostrum or underside, uh, jumping on top of the animal's blow hole, trying to separate, trying to push them apart, trying to trying to injure the calf in some way. You can see here, uh, and often these hunts are led by females, often the lead matriarch of the group. Uh, males sometimes will kind of hunt the periphery, but often we also we sometimes also see them involved, uh, as well as calves. Towards the end of the hunt, though, one thing we noticed um, is a lot of this ramming, looking at the head of the gray whale, trying to, trying to ram it here, and, and often you see there is either blood uh, coming from the mouth. And uh, one, one hypothesis we kind of have is that there's a potential that the arteries in the lower jaw, it might be easier to break those arteries, uh, making it difficult or break the lower jaw. So making it difficult for the calf to try to breathe. Um, and then after that, the transients can either try to drown the calf um, to, to eat it. Um, at the, towards the end of the hunt, transients often will split up um, prey. So you can see here, uh, and I apologize for the bit of the gruesomeness, but uh, you can see a transient here. They'll kind of grab onto the tissue of a gray whale. They'll kind of shake their head side to side to take pieces of tissue. Um, they'll feed on gray whale calves for extended periods of time, sometimes two to three days. Uh, and they'll, the, you know, we've come back the next day to an encounter where the killer whales are still there. Uh, but on occasion, they'll just eat the lower jaw and tongue. Uh, of the gray whale calf. And this is something that has been noticed by whalers and biologists around the world that have witnessed killer whales um, hunting uh, large species of whales, uh, is that the just eat the lower tall and jung and tongue. And this is this might be due to the fact that uh, the negative buoyancy of, of large whales, they may sink below the diving capacity of the, of the killer whale's ability to dive. And being able to get at the soft tissues like the lower jaw and tongue might enable them to eat quickly. Instead of looking at the, instead of trying to target the thicker hide. Uh, seasonally, though, prey um, is only, we, one of the things to take from here is that gray whale calves are only visualized, uh, are only been encountered in attacking gray whale calves, uh, killer whale transients have uh, during the spring months. Uh, and you can see here that uh, throughout the year, other prey seem to be targeted. Uh, but even though it's a sad situation, these gray whale calves being hunted by killer whales, it's a part of life. Uh, and killer whales may actually provide what we call ecosystem services, uh, where a predation, say, of a, a gray whale calf may provide um, an ecosystem leap or um, uh, enables um, communities that are either at the deep sea, like in the Monterey Canyon, uh, to access food and, and deep sea environments are typically illegal trophic. They don't have a lot of nutrients and often finding food is difficult. So when a gray whale calf settles at the bottom, um, it provides a fast community of uh, scavengers and bacteria to feed and uh, provides these ecosystems with a wealth of nutrients, thousands of kilograms. Um, and this is some of the lead studies that were conducted by Ambari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, who have, who have actually witnessed and documented uh, these whale falls um, over time. And in some of these whale falls, uh, there's these deep sea pelagic worms uh, or benthic worms that are, that are only associated or have been identified with whale falls, uh, is, which is spectacular. And there has been now recent studies suggesting that some of these worms uh, uh, these scavenging worms may actually be found between ocean basins of this and that are the same species uh, and showing connections between oceans and ecosystems. So it's, it's, it's brand new research that's very exciting. Occasionally, though, we get gray whale calves that wash up on beaches uh, and we can kind of document what really happened. Uh, and this has happened on a number of occasions. You can see the, these uh, rake marks uh, or deep tooth uh, marks from killer whales. Uh, and the lower jaws that are missing, and we can kind of get a feel for some of the biology and some of the um, some of the, how these killer whales end up killing their prey. Uh, when when hunting, though, the average group size is very similar to what we see at the coastal transients, as mentioned above in the Oregon section. We see an average of around four to five individuals. Um, 
when they're hunting, but these associations with large prey, especially with gray whale calves, often involve larger groups, up to even 25 animals. Um, and often when we're watching a hunt of a gray whale calf, it will involve a, a group of five or six. And then over time, as that hunt progresses, we'll see more transient groups enter the area and they'll join in on the hunt and feed. So gray whale predation events, even though they're for food purposes or for energy input, it could also be a social interaction involving opportunities for different transient groups to hunt and, and um, interact and socialize and mate. Uh, we also see hunts on small cetaceans like oceanic dolphins, uh, dolls, porpoise, uh, Pacific white-sided dolphins, which are often highly energetic and exciting. Killer whales are very much experts at cutting off the path of retreat for um, small cetaceans, which are also very quick and are very exciting to watch. Uh, killer whales breaching in the air, leaving the water, ramming the dolphins. Um, it's it's a, an exciting event. Um, and sea lions being their main prey, we've had some great opportunities to, to watch hunts even underneath the water. So that hunt was a, a California sea lion that had been encountered by a group of two different fa family match lines of transients in Monterey Bay and uh, ended up, they, they ended up getting the sea lion, but the sea lion hid for quite a while underneath our boat um, and was finally killed after about an hour. Um, so for more information, if you're interested on killer whales, um, you can check us out at the UBC's Institute for Oceans and Fisheries, the Marine Mammal Research Unit. We have some pretty fascinating studies. Um, uh, you can also visit uh, the Transient Killer Whale Research Project, um, One of Fuca Marine Research, uh, NOAA's National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as well as um, Oregon State University, um, OSU's Marine Mammal Institute, and the American Cetacean Society for more information. Uh, but I want to thank everyone for listening, and uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, so much great information. Thank you so much for sharing all that. We had some great questions roll in. And again, to the audience, if you have any questions, feel free to add them to the chat. Um, I always like to kick this off, though, um, with kind of a question around your inspiration. Was there an aha moment or a special experience or or what was that? What was it that you said, I want to study these more? Yeah, um, so I was, I grew up on northeastern Vancouver Island, which is a pretty remote community. It's uh, kind of in the middle of nowhere, but it was where kind of killer whale research kind of started uh, in the 1970s. And that area was uh, a highway for captures of killer whales um, for the ocean area industry. And when I was about 12 years old, you know, growing up, we had a place on the water, uh, my family, and we would watch killer whales go by our house on a daily basis. Um, and the killer whales in northeastern Vancouver Island near Telegraph Cove and Port McNeil, you see them almost every day. Um, and I remember I was sitting on a dock one day off of uh, fishing with my family, and uh, we ended up seeing a group of dolphins, specific white-sided dolphins, come roaring into this little harbor and a group of transients had been hunting behind them and they killed the dolphin um in a land one of them died on the beach it beached itself and died and i was sitting there just my jaw was open and uh my mouth and just in awe and uh then two weeks later i you know my my teachers in elementary school had known i was interested in whales and i was invited to join a necropsy of that dolphin uh and uh, after that i was completely obsessed and um i just uh it's been quite a few years now so oh, cool at such a young age even that's awesome uh where did big's name get identified to transient orca yeah great question uh so the history between behind transient killer whales um it's very interesting because uh in the 1970s they didn't really we didn't really know anything about um, transient resident killer whales. They're all thought as just being killer whales. And um, we didn't know that there was a mammal eating form or a fish eating form. And it wasn't until Michael Big, um, who uh -huh. is the lead was the was the lead scientist um, at the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, who was tasked with trying to figure out how many killer whales there were in the inland waters of the Pacific Northwest. Um, he 
he kind of found, he found trends. He was also the one that developed the photo identification system I mentioned earlier. And he discovered that there's transients in residence. And um, after he passed away, unfortunately, in 1990, but his, his colleagues had actually uh, spearheaded the Biggs terminology uh, in his honor. Um, and transients historically kind of the name everybody's used and Biggs is kind of the new uh, mm. name that is being adopted, but they're interchangeable. Nice. I did not know that. Can you speak about potential about the potential impact from renewable and en marine re renewable energy? Does that have impact to the work? Of That's a great question. I mean, there hasn't been a lot of studies on that. It's been a lot of the government reports that have come out have suggested that as being an issue for killer whales, especially because killer whales are dolphins. They rely on communication mm -hmm. um, to find their way around. So having large uh, sounds would uh, from underwater technology like uh, tidal turbines may have uh, it, in, it might have an impact on killer whales, especially transients more so than residents. Uh, transients, as I mentioned, are passive listening. They don't use communication as much to find prey. They're trying mm -hmm. to hunt seals and sea lions by being quiet. So mm -hmm. if you can't hear your prey splashing and you can't right. find them, that's a big problem. Uh, so it could be an issue. Um, I haven't seen too many more studies on it because I think a lot of these technologies are still fairly new um, as we move into that area. Um, and then uh, someone, Paul mentioned, he understands that some of them target Chinook, but not other salmon like chum or coho. Is that true? And then also a second part of the question, do pollutants impact their productivity? Yeah, so those are great questions. Uh, so the resident killer whales are Chinook specialists. Um, they prefer Chinook, but um, it has also been known the southern residents, uh, especially in the fall and winter, have been known to go for chum salmon. Um, it was actually Brad Hansen at Northwest Fisheries Science Center, who is out of Seattle. He's the leader of the, the southern resident killer whale research, and uh, he's done a lot of work with fecal samples. And even though Chinook salmon seems to be the abundant species, they have been known to target other species to less degrees, um, to a less degree. But Chinook being the fattiest salmon, uh, the most nutrients um, you're going to get uh, from sockeye or pink or the other ones, you're as a big animal like a killer whale that can be up to 15,000 pounds, um, going for the largest prey like a Chinook salmon is you're going to get the best energy from that. Um, and you, you'll spend less time foraging, you can spend more time socializing, mating. But if you're feeding on prey that's less nutritious, like sockeye salmon, or and sockeye salmon is actually the healthiest for us, um, but is the less nutritious, and the fact we're like fats in that, uh, your omega 3s, um, you're going to be spending more time hunting, which means you're going to be less time mating, less time socializing, which can have um, issues for reproduction in a whole bunch of different areas. Uh, so what was the other part of that question? And then do pollutants uh, impact their productivity? So that's a great question. And pollutants are a, a major source like DDTs, PCBs, which um, are all of uh, bioaccumulating toxins. Um, these, uh, these pollutants have been known to accumulate in killer whales, especially being at the top of the food chain. Um, they make their way up the food chain right from basically plankton all the way up. And uh, what we do know is that they have, there's been studies on harbor seals that have shown that it, it actually disrupts their immune system, causes infertility. Uh, but one of the issues with killer whales is that we don't have enough studies on them, even though you know, we can hypothesize that they do have an issue on their immune system. Um, but right now what we're seeing is a boom in the transient population of British Columbia. Um, they're doing quite well compared to the residents. Uh, transients now are up to close to 380 animals uh, for the coastal transient population, um, which means, and they're at the, they're higher up on the food chain than the residents because they're eating marine mammals. Uh, so we're not really seeing uh, any sort of disruption from uh, bioaccumulating toxins uh, on that population. But it's likely if they started to starve or their food source started to go down, uh, likely these chemicals may be more presented uh, based on the fact that they're uh, maybe more susceptible to disease because they're not getting the right nutrient intake. Oh, very interesting. Uh, can you describe the challenges to identifying killer whales over time? You mentioned saddle patches and fin scars and other characteristics used to identify them. And then I have a little add on to that. Do they, are they born with those um, saddle notches, or is that something that happens due to an occurrence? 
That's a great question and something, you know, every photo ID analyst struggles with. Um, and uh, when they're born, I'll, I'll start there. When they're born, they have an eye patch, what we call the postocular patch. That's that big white area near the head, uh, near the rostrum of the whale. Um, mm -hmm. And that eye patch is there. But the calves don't develop that saddle patch, that, that white saddle patch, until about six, three to six months old. They don't start to see that faint saddle patch. So when they're, and we don't see the notches, those notches that you see on the fin that are missing chunks of tissue um, is usually from something environmental, either from each other or from their prey or from maybe hunting along a reef and it scrapes them or hurts them. Um, and, but when they're born, we rely on the eye patch um, instead of the saddle patch. Uh, as they get older, though, the difficulty of identifying them, get, it gets difficult, especially for the work we were doing off of California and Oregon. Because some of the whales we would not, there was one whale we had seen once and then we didn't see it again for 10 years. Uh, and it's, it can be so difficult. So often we have a rule, it has to be at least two identifying features. It can't be one. So if it's a, either the shape of the fin in a particular notch or a scrape on the saddle patch in a particular notch, there has to be at least two features present. Um, and it can be difficult though. And those notches can change uh, over time. They can either, they, as they get older, they start to widen out a bit on the fin. Mm -hmm. um, it gets smoother. Uh, so it can be really a challenge. And often we confirm it uh, myself, say if I identify a killer whale, um, a researcher in our group will then confirm that. Um, and, and that's kind of how we, we do it that way. Very good. What's the lifespan of a transient killer whale? Great question. Uh, so kill, we, you know, killer whales in general um, have a lifespan between, for average for males, uh, it's about 30, 40 years, uh, maximum about 60. Uh, females live longer, um, on average about 50, 60 years with um, uh, up to 100. There's one killer whale in the Southern mm -hmm. Residence that lived to, they believe to be between 80 and 103 years of age. Um, her name is Granny. She passed away a few years ago, um, but into a transient is very similar too as well. Um, with that longevity, yeah. And then if folks have observations, where can they send them? Is that Facebook group something I can share? Yeah, absolutely. In so the chat. Yeah, absolutely. So we've, we're currently in development of a new website. Um, I, we have an email as well. I could put it in the chat as well. Um, and what we started, what we found with social media was one of the best ways to really get real time information, uh, as well as getting historical information. Everybody, you know, is on social media these days and they want to share photographs of theirs. But sometimes with killer was especially nobody knows where to go off of Oregon or California to share their images. So we found a lot of images were locked in history. In, in, back in history and no one knew. So what we did is we developed a Facebook page um, for people in Oregon and we have one for California as well. And people can join and you can take a look at the orca sightings there. You can contribute if you like, if you have anything that's there. Uh, and we try to, you know, it's open for people to look at. So um, yeah, there's a couple of security questions to make sure you're not a robot, but uh, <laughs> other than that though, you're, you're, uh, you're most welcome to join and, and contribute. Very cool. Um, this person read that orcas that appear on Burren Inlet, I don't know if I pronounced that right, in Vancouver, um, in and around the float plane bases are transients. Is that true? So, yeah, a lot of times when we see transients, um, like distinguishing them and say, say if you're far from land and you're kind of curious to know what the whales you're seeing, because you don't see the patch, the, uh, the saddle patch, you're not seeing, you know, you don't recognize the whale. Um, often one of the things is I mentioned group size. Uh, transients are usually in these smaller groups, uh, five to 10 animals, some, you know, typically four to five is the average for the natural lineal size. Um, but they do go into these areas that are very much like small bays, inlets, mm -hmm. um, in areas where resident killer whales, we don't see them go. Residents often spend their time in these um, open mainland fjord areas or in straits, and the transients will duck into small bays, into areas you never think a transient would be. Um, I remember there was a group of transients went right into Hood Canal in Washington for almost five months. They were in there for five months. Wow. Straight into, and um, they spend a lot of time in these areas. So often that's a way you can kind of distinguish transient. For research purposes, we have to have a photo identified individual to consider because mm -hmm. uh, you never know what killer whales. They can be anywhere. And uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it can be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then someone asked if this was recorded. This is being recorded and it will be shared on our YouTube and our blog. Um, and you'll get a link actually to that YouTube channel on Tuesday morning. Um, Somebody else also mentioned there is a title project south of Seal Rock. 
So I don't know if you're familiar with that or how that relates to ORCA. Maybe they can share a bit more on that. Um, how can the huge fin of a male orca be hydrodynamic? That's a good question. Um, and the large dorsal fin is a, is a, a secondary sexual characteristic. It's a, what we call sexual dimorphism. And male killer whales just don't have a large dorsal fin. They also have large pectoral fins, which are those flippers in front, and their flukes get substantially bigger. Um, it isn't necessarily hydrodynamic, but the one thing a dorsal fin could be, a male dorsal fin, females might like the look of a larger dorsal fin. It also could be uh, something for dealing with heat transfer. Killer whales are found around the world. Uh, they're not just found in the cold temperate seas off of Oregon and Washington and Canada. They're also found in the Antarctic. They're found in the Arctic. They're found in the tropics, um, in places like Hawaii, Papua New Guinea. Every, they're found everywhere in the world, um, in the world's oceans. And having um, a large dorsal fin in those, and even a female's dorsal fin is quite large compared to other species of cetacean. So being able to um, heat transfer, dealing with heat transfer, having these large areas uh, can help them with, um, with that. A lot of it's just connective tissue. There's no bone in the dorsal fin at all. And I've also read that for orcas who have been in captivity, that that flops over um, yeah. as well. Um, let's see, is any kind of geolocating tracking possible with killer whales? Absolutely. Um, it's dependent though. Uh, there was a, some work using satellite telemetry work uh, that NOAA was conducting in Southwest Fisheries. Um, they were attaching satellite tags to Southern resident killer whales for quite a few years. Um, it's a study that was done for looking at where the habitat characteristics were for resident orcas off the Oregon coast and California coast during the winter time because these are areas where it's difficult to get to in the winter because of storms uh it's open ocean it's mm -hmm. it can be very difficult and dangerous uh, and also hard to find the whales in those seas um especially in such a vast area so satellite tagging and suction cup tagging which is less invasive um because yeah, it's actually just a suction cup that sticks onto the whale we call it mm -hmm. a d-tag um it actually is showed great results for looking at behavior even short periods of time 24 hours of diving patterns uh, where the whales go uh we're very interested in looking at uh currently in the next couple of years of looking at some of the killer whales in california and where they're going especially these oceanic whales um and we're kind of in talks with NOAA to try to maybe spearhead a study like that in the near future what a cool study. Um, I watched a seminar Dr. Carl J. Walters did on pinniped impacts on salmon populations. He mentioned population control, harvesting pinnipeds. What are your thoughts on this? Well, that's a great question. I, I actually know Carl. Um, he works at the University of British Columbia as well. He's a fisheries. <laughs> he's, a, he's an amazing ecosystem modeler. Um, uh, so one of the problems uh, with seal pinniped control control is, and I'll be straight up, is uh, that we don't know how it affects the predators that eat the seals. So what we're really thinking of is a trophic level. So we're looking seals eating salmon or seals eating fish that are commercially important, like salmon, mm -hmm. herring. Um, but what we're not really connecting is the fact that there are predators that rely on the seals. So one, of the, one area is that transient killer whales are very much adapted to hunting harbor seals. Um, and we don't know that connection well enough to be trying to control a population. So in the 1970s, transients were infrequent visitors to the Salish Sea. When Michael Big, as I mentioned before, they were special, they were focused on resident killer whales and transients were kind of these nomad whales that came in occasionally. You might not see a transient for three to four months. Um, but as the population of seals rebounded, because prior to the 70s, there was governments did propose these population control on pinnipeds, seals and mm -hmm. sea lions. But after the the Marine Mammal Protection Act and protection came in place for marine mammals, that seal population rebounded. And what we're seeing now is also a rebounding of transients. As I mentioned, we're seeing transients getting reports of transients on a daily basis now. Um, so you can start to see this logistical curve happening where you see a seal population is increasing. They're also seeing the transient population is increasing. Um, and likely over time, it might be not as fast as some people want, like, like commercial fishermen, that they might be hoping that it'd be the population will start to decline at some point soon, uh, but that population of seals are leveling out. 
um, and transients are eating seals, um, you know, and that population is growing. So um, over time, you will see a normal predator prey relationship where the seals will decrease with and and likely the killer whales will decrease over time. And then you'll see that up and down movement. Right, right. Um, have offshores and transients been autopsied to determine if they also are con concentrating pollutants? Yeah, there, you know, offshores are rare. There was an offshore killer whale that was washed up in uh, Tofino, BC, um, uh, quite a few years ago now. That um, I don't know too much about the toxin levels in the offshores. I, I think offshores and transients, well, transients have been biopsied. Um, and they've shown the transients do. There has been some studies by Peter Ross at the Vancouver Aquarium, OceanWise, that has shown, he's a toxicologist, that have shown transients to have very, very high levels of contaminants. Um, offshores, there's not as much information known about their toxins, but they, offshores focus on feeding on sharks. And specific and Pacific, Pacific sleeper sharks and uh, six gill sharks, which are deep water species, but have a lot of fat and oil in them. And that's where a lot of these pollutants are concentrated. So, and that these sharks also are kind of higher up in the food chain. It's likely that they probably also accumulate a lot of toxins as well. And then we have a second part to the question regarding Dr. Walters. Dr. Walters said that there's plenty of other prey for trans that transients can eat. Is this really the case for transients off the coast of BC and Vancouver Island? So that's a great question. Um, and as Dr. Walters said, that is that, you know, they do eat other species. They eat sea lions, they eat harbor porpoise, but to what degree though, there's, there is, harbor seals are fairly defenseless against a killer whale. So in comparison to maybe a speedy doll's porpoise, which is difficult to get, you're spending a lot of energy trying to kill that porpoise. Or a large sea lion, which can be like a stellar sea lion, which can be potentially dangerous, even to a killer whale. Um, a harbor seal is fairly easy to kill. So killer whales, it's not just about what you can eat, it's about what you've culturally, killer whales have a culture. It's what they're culturally evolved and adapted to feeding on. So for example, they, these these areas where they visit these bays and inlets where they're searching for harbor seals, they've learned this behavior uh, probably over generations um, of how to hunt these prey. So decimating a potential prey that they've adapted to hunting for so long, specifically harbor seals, would probably have a devastating effect on killer whales, especially if they've um, adapted eating that prey over other species that they occasionally attack. Um, and some groups we found um, spend more time visiting harbor seal areas during the seasonality in the, in the, in the late summer in, off Vancouver Island um, and decreasing that might be um, likely would be devastating to that to some of the whales in that population. Mm -hmm. And that wraps our Q&A session. Josh, I want to thank you so much again for joining us this morning and sharing so much information and photographs and video and sound about this amazing species. Uh, really looking forward to just kind of following along with it, you know, um, and and hopefully being able to send in some observations of my own <laughs> someday uh. if I if I get the good fortune of making some. Um, but with that, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, audience, for joining us. Hope to see you at a future presentation. And with that, goodbye. Thank you.